Welcome everybody to the Firewife Summit this evening. I am super excited that so many of you could be here live and we will go into quite a few questions and plenty of time for um, extra questions after we have our next speaker session. I would first like to really thank our sponsors who have allowed me to keep this event free and being able to reach so many spouses and significant others out there to bring this to you. And that is MomWeb's hosting, Carney Strong, Multimedia Content Solutions, Mouse Ear Magic Travel, Laura Sira, Appetite for Design, and Stitching the Night Away. I am so thankful that they were, were here so that I could upgrade our room and so many other things to get enough space for everybody to be able to be in here. Um, but a big thank you is to my friend Cher Jewett, who is going to be here to chat with me as well now. Um, I am not a super religious person, so I absolutely love it when I run into people that are not afraid to banter back and forth with me and, and talk about how their faith and their religion plays a part in their life. I love learning the, the different ways and the different aspects that comes into play. Um, Cher is a chaplain for, uh, well, first of all, our husbands work together. Um, and the funny thing is, is that I didn't really meet Cher in that way. I met Cher more as she was the she's the chaplain for our fire department and the Bonnie Lake, um, our, our East Pierce Fire Department and the Bonnie Lake Police Department. And that's actually how I met her, met her. Um, we'd met at events, I'm sure, but I actually got to know her more when we were putting on an event for the probies and talking about um, the mental health and, and all of that. And I'm super excited to have you on here. I love chatting with you. Um, I, uh, I'm probably gushing enough, right? <laughs> I just want to thank you for being here, Cher, and having this conversation that we're going to have about um, faith and hope and light as far as the mental health goes. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to get to talk with you about it. <laughs> so I know one of the main things when we started talking that um, was a big change for me is what is the chaplain program for you? Yeah, um, I know it can be different for different departments. Um, basically that's how I like to describe it to people is I hold the rank of a chaplain, but my job description is that as a crisis, crisis intervention specialist. Um, we're resources for both the community and then for the department, but not just the department members, for their family members as well. So that includes spouses and children, um, whole department encompassing. Um, there's definitely a misconception about chaplains that it's all about religion and prayer that we show up on the scene and we've got our Bible and we're ready to pray over you. And we're just going to impart all of our faith upon you. Um, obviously aspects of that come into play, but they come into play upon request. Um, we're a resource for any situation where there's an emotional or mental crisis. Um, we're specifically trained in crisis management and um, we hold a wealth of resource information. Um, for just the community and for our department members. So, um, and I know that was one of yeah. the like really big things was because I didn't realize that religion doesn't really come into play, at least for our department. Like you said, uh, other departments might be totally different, but in our area, um, I, I did. I just assumed I associated chaplain with church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so once you started digging more into it and how much training you've had, and it has nothing to do with, you know, your, your whole faith and stuff with, with your training, your training is the training that like peer support and stuff like that's going to get. For sure. Like we're available to do debriefings, either one-on-one -on -one or individual, and they can be formal after a big event, or they can be casual over coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, we can provide, like I said, resources for mental health, for counseling, for therapy, um, just overall assistance to people in crisis or on the verge of crisis. Um, for the family members, as chaplains, we're connected to the inner workings of the department. So for the family members, we can give a little bit of more insight as to the inner workings of the department to help spouses kind of understand some of the policies, protocols, and the procedures that are taking place. Um, we can definitely act as a liaison 
um, for the family to the department. So how did, how did you get into the program? What led you to joining the program? I became a soup lady. I don't know if you know what the soup ladies are, but basically they provide meals to first responders in crisis situations. Um, and when I was on scene, I would, you would just look in the eyes of some of these responders and you could just see that they were reeling inside um, what they were witnessing and what they were taking part of. And if you just gave them a little glimpse of how are you doing or how are you holding up, it was just like everything came out. They needed somebody to talk to. Um, so I talked to Ginger about it, who is the founder of it. And she's like, you know, that's where chaplaincy comes into play. And maybe it's something you can, can should consider. Um, so I did, I ended up signing up for our local chaplain academy. Um, and I was supposed to start a week after the Vegas 10 one nine route 91 shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, so soup ladies were requested to go down there. So I went down there. And that kind of just gave me the confirmation while I was down there working with the agencies down there that it was the path that I needed to take. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And then I'm a uh, daughter of a deputy, a brother. My brother and my brother-in-law are both law enforcement, and then obviously my husband and his brother are firefighters. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's just kind of the family way. There must be fun banter at, at holidays. Oh, it's kind of <laughs> <the conversation. laughs> <laughs> Back and forth on fire, <laughs> fire, please. <laughs> so um, we definitely are going to get into the faith aspect for all of this. So what does faith mean to you? For me, it's believing in something greater than yourself or greater than that of this world. Um, for me, it's God. And I understand that that's not for everyone and it's not what everyone's faith is going to mean. But everyone can have a faith in something greater than themselves. Um, I know I fail daily on a daily, daily basis. Our bodies fail us daily. Um, our minds fail, people fail us. Um, but when we have a hope in something greater than ourselves that won't fail us, it gives us something to have a constant in. Um, faith helps people accept what they can't change. Um, and it helps us find a peace despite the circumstances that are taking place around us. Um, faith can be that light in that dark room. Um, and I, having faith doesn't necessarily mean you're naive or pretending that what's happening around you isn't happening. Um, it's not like you're just a child and you close your eyes and everything goes away and you can't see it. You know, um, it's just, it's having that simple belief that you don't have to figure it out, that you aren't alone. And that for me, it's that God's gonna help me, guide me, provide for me um, and bring people alongside me that are going to be there for me. So. And I know when we were chatting earlier, it was, it was when you start talking and um, cause for those of you who don't know, I'm not religious. I don't follow a religion. Um, but has, as Sharon and I were talking it's just like, but I do believe in higher something. And I do believe in a lot of this stuff and the faith I know is, has helped me in so many things. So, um, it's one of the reasons why I just absolutely adore talking about it. It's like, we can all agree on so much different stuff. And, and as long as we can all overlook whatever religion and just put it aside, <laughs> it works yeah. out magically. So I did I, want to ask you, um, can you tell me about a time that you feel that your faith helped you through a difficult department situation? Yeah. Um, so I think it was, I responded to a car accident um, where there was a child that basically witnessed his parents die in the car seat next to him. Um, and with my faith, even though obviously like that broke my heart for that child and for that family, I have a hope that there'll be healing for that family. Um, it's beyond my control and my ability to fix them. But that doesn't mean that just because I have faith, I don't have to take action to maintain my hope. Um, I had a witness on that scene that contacted me multiple times that week, just trying to process what she had seen and make sense of it. Um, and then we do foster care and that week had just been, we had court and it was an, it took a terrible turn. Um, it was one of those weeks where everything just kind of piled on and piled on. 
Um, and by the end of the week, I noticed I was super irritable. I was not a fun wife to be around. Um, I wasn't that awesome Pinterest mom that week, you know, um, I was cranky as all good <laughs> and I was driving and I can specifically remember now where I was. And I felt like I was either going to scream or cry or scream and cry. Um, and it was in that moment that I felt that nudge, that, like I need to debrief myself. Um, all the outside world stuff had piled on. Um, and I knew that I needed to do briefing and I have my person who is a chaplain and I knew that I could call them and sit with them and talk with them and just let it all out and unload that weight so that I could carry on again. Um, and I think just because you have faith in God and hope doesn't mean that the world remains perfect. It just gives you a different viewpoint and perspective on how you conquer it. Mm -hmm. In a, I, I know that, um, and you had said that you're getting irritable and, and the angry and the upset, all of the signs that we were just told by Jeff to, to start looking for. <laughs> um, wow. So I think it's super important that we do make sure that our firefighters see these, these signs so that they can recognize it too. And hopefully they can connect with people and, and know that um, my dogs are going to start fighting here. <laughs> when that they start realizing what those signs are, then hopefully they can put it in place too, that they've got their person to talk to as well. Um, mm -hmm. sorry, they, they just well, I think even, even as spouses, recognizing it in ourselves, that we have, we're taking on the trauma that our husbands are going through as well. We're hearing, I know not for all the wives, but for some of the wives, I'm my, per, my husband's person. So I'm the person that he comes and offloads to and, you're going to carry some of that weight and eventually that weight's going to pile up into the left and you're going to start to feel it yourself. You need to be able to have your person that you can go to and load that stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. Cause yeah, I, I, that was one of the transitions that was a little bit hard for us is that I was his debriefing for all of those years while he was volunteer. And then when he became hired, I wasn't anymore. So that was hard. It was hard for all of it because he had decided that he didn't need to bring it home anymore because now it's a job. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know what's going on in your life anymore. <laughs> it's a major transition for us in that department. <laughs> so how do you feel that your faith applies to helping you as a fire wife? So when he's coming home and he is debriefing. Yeah, well, I think we actually with all the fires going on in California, I'm a wildland fire wife as well. He does wildland firefighting. Um, and it's terrifying as a wife to think of the circumstances we're gonna be in. And um, he did wildland firefighting in Southern California for many years and that's wild, unpredictable, fast moving fire. Um, but my faith helps give me a calm and a peace that I probably shouldn't have, but there's just something supernatural that I'm able to press into that just allows me to know that like, it's gonna be okay. Um, I can lean into my faith and know that God's going to give wisdom to his superiors on the line, that God's going to help my husband remember the skills that he needs to in those moments when he's under extreme pressure, that, um, that I can just have a peace and rest in that without driving myself crazy. Mm -hmm. um, even when he leaves for work, I don't know what he's going to face. Um, he could be, you know, like on a call and um, I just have a faith that there's a, a peace in myself that um, he's protected and I can rest in that in myself. Um, it's also finding like-minded people to surround myself with, like my tribe that understands the fears, um, but also has that same like-minded faith that you can rest in the hope that there's purpose in what he's doing and there's purpose in his career and it gives me the strength to be his support. Yeah, I agree. I think that has a, a lot, a lot of, you know, women will say, you know, they have trust in their training and all of that. And I think that that goes a long ways for the same thing. You're just, you're trusting. You just have to trust, mm -hmm. whether it's a higher power or training or, or any of that. It's just, um, you can't drive yourself insane. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So how does your faith come into play as you talk to your firefighter? Is there anything that changes in that um i think we both have the same like faith and belief in god um so for us when one of us is in the thick of it we have the other one to spiritually lift us up 
Um, we can remind the other person that we're capable of getting through the circumstance um, because we have a God bigger than the circumstance that's going to provide a way out or a solution or an opportunity um, that we're not in it alone. Um, like I said, we do foster care and we had two little boys that our adoption fell through. Um, we had them for three years and when they left, it broke me. Um, husband was the one who had the strength to support me and come alongside me and remind me that the pain wasn't pointless and it wasn't in vain. Um, skip ahead three years and we were back in that same situation with an adoption falling through. And yet this time it wasn't me that broke, it was my husband that broke. Um, but the pain that I survived, it qualified me to lift him up and encourage him and support him having gone through it. Um, even though my heart was breaking, I had a piece that gave me comfort that allowed me to be what he needed. Mm -hmm. So I think just us having that to fall back on and a foundation that isn't changing and that a solid base, I think we're able to be that support to each other. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so when we were talking, I loved it because I didn't realize how many different like possible sayings might be coming from the Bible or, or anything that, that I absolutely fall in love with. <laughs> So when we were chatting, you brought up this great saying, the be still and know. Um, can you tell me what that means to you, how, how you interpret that? Yeah, so the full, it's from Psalms 4610, and it says, be still and know that I am God. Um, the Hebrew meaning for be still is let go. And how many of us have heard the whole saying, like, let go and let God? Well, that's basically where this is coming from. It just requires a faith in something bigger than yourself to let go and allow yourself to be led. Um, how many of us as wives want to control everything where this is just loosening the grip and allowing something that's a higher power, um, something that's a constant to lead and to guide us. Um, we want to control everything, but I think if we allow faith to allow us to believe in a God that, or a life form bigger than ourselves, that he has a good plan and a bigger plan for us. Um, I think if we stop trying to twist life to fit the way that we think it should look, and allow ourselves to have faith and hope that what we're going through is preparing us, it's strengthening us, it's equipping us for something bigger to be used by. Yeah, it's so hard. The whole control issues is so hard because we're just, we're supposed to be strong and take care of everything, but then we're supposed to bring them back in and then we're supposed to be however we were before, you know, we had to take care of everything. And it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, here we're changing how we react to everything. They're changing how it is. And, and I, I think that's probably where when you guys both have your same, your same faith that that really comes into play. It's, that you can yeah. be in that total middle. Mm -hmm. So can you share your little story you had about the three-legged stool, the analogy you had? My I love analogies. Analogy. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I'm going to put it into perspective. Yeah. Um, so to have proper balance in life, we need to maintain our physical, our mental, and our spiritual self. Um, when one of those becomes off kilter or it's missing, we lose our balance. Um, spiritual self is the core of our belief system. It's who we are. It's where our moral boundaries come from. It's our sense of self. So if we lose balance in one of those areas, we lose balance in life. And um, I don't expect that everyone's spiritual balance will look the same as mine. It's going to be different for everyone. Um, for some, it may be either faith in God. Others, it's meditation. Um, some, it's just being in nature and surrounding yourself in it. But when we have... We have all have to find um, some sense of spiritual direction to have balance in our lives, something greater than ourselves to believe in that's a constant. So that three-legged stool is kind of about keeping balance, keeping our physical, our physical health, our mental health, and our spiritual health all engaged and active and not allowing one to lead more or less. Yeah, and I, I love that because um... – we focus so much on the, the, just the mental and just, just the physical, um, without thinking how much that spiritual actually comes into play, whether you're religious or not, that spiritual, mm -hmm. spiritual part for me is what's made a huge difference in my last two years and how much I have grown and how, how much happier I have become 
because I leaned into whatever, you know, I, I didn't even know what I was leaning into, but I just, I just embraced whatever was going to happen. <laughs> and that was yeah. definitely that spiritual part. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like I said, the spiritual health is so much of our core. It's who we are. And um, that's where our, our moral boundaries come from. That's where our sense of self comes from. And when you lose that sense of self, it allows all the other things of the world to kind of come in and pile on top of you where then you become more susceptible mentally and um, depression and PTSD and all those things. You're more susceptible to the trauma effect because you've lost a sense of self. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. Yeah. Tina, spiritual is not a dirty word. I so agree. I, you know, it's just, it's kind of like, you know, the chaplain was totally associated with, with church, um, we've got all of these like old school ideas that are not real because we haven't looked into them because we just assume, <laughs> assume we know what it all means. But yeah, definitely. Spirituality is not a dirty word and there's plenty of, and if you don't like the word, there's plenty of other words that you can use for it as well. I was just trying to look through here really quick. Um, culturally, culturally, I cannot say that word culturally brainwashed yeah. <laughs> Shelley says yeah there's definitely a lot of that um and yeah the whole assuming different things like I said with the chaplain and the spirituality and and then I think the whole you know especially if if you have a department that can be a little bit clicky um that you know you feel like you're supposed to fit in and and be this certain way and uh, I think that's a lot where your spirituality comes into play because if you start trying to fit in with the different groups and you're changing who you are at the core, um, you're going to be absolutely miserable. Um, let's see, go oh, a quote. Jessica, Jessica's got a quote. A quote I fell in love with today regarding self-care. An empty lantern provides no light. Self-care is the fuel that allows your light to shine brightly. I like it. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you have I any? had, yeah, I had one Go more fun little analogy. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. I just think if, if you visualize, like you hear a lot of times purpose in the pit um, and how the pit can be such a dark place. And I think if you visualize yourself, if you're in the pit and you visualize the pit um, with the bright light at the top and you're keeping your focus and your hope on what's outside that pit, there's hands reaching down to pull you up. God or whatever it is that you're leaning into provides people and opportunities and therapies that are there if we're willing to take that hand, that reach out that's coming down into the pit to help pull you out. And once you reach the top, now you have the ability to turn around and be one of those hands reaching down to help others. You're using what you've been through to qualify you um, to become that to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you become somebody's a little bit of higher power too, because <laughs> we all need people to call on for sure on that way up and help, rem help remind us who we are and, and why we're doing certain things as well. Um, did you have, do you have anything else? Cher? I think we kind of squished it all in do a neat little package there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, I would really love to thank you for being here and bringing this, this other side, which doesn't feel so much like another side anymore. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm getting older too. So <laughs> it might be because I'm getting older. So I'm just more open to a lot of things and how they're all correlating as the years go by. But I do want to thank you for coming in and, and talking to us more on this faith and hope. Um, and I don't think we even got into the hope, did we? So much. Um, I don't think so. I think when you have faith, it just kind of naturally comes because you've got something to, like I said, a foundation to stand on that gives you something that's not failing. Right. Maybe we talk about like how we fail and people fail us, but when you have a sense of something that's not of this world, that's not going to fail you. Right. So that does give you hope. It always gives you hope. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you for being here, Cher. I really appreciate it. Um, Cher and I and another fire wife uh, actually started our little our little department group uh, that we're trying to get everybody access to. So we've been doing all of this has been kind of going around the fact that we knew as um, 
the three of us, there was some mental health issues that were happening. And we knew that we had had a disconnect because everybody just kind of assumed that everybody was talking to each other. And what we found when we started talking to more people in our, or wives in our department was the fact that nobody was talking to each other and nobody knew what was going on. So for us, we um, share talk to the chief and we got together as a group and we've just started a little Facebook group and we're putting together little events um, trying to do every month just to get people involved and communicating again and getting people swapping phone numbers and, and um, being their backup and just if they need daycare, you know, they need somebody to watch the kid or just any of that. Um, that's what our project has been right now. <laughs> our next project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it's so Sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's so important to have your tribe that you surround yourself with that are like-minded and that understand. And um, you don't want to be in the thick of it and not know the people that are going to be coming around and surrounding you and supporting you. You already want to be in these people's homes. You want to know them. You want to have been side by side with them so that if God forbid something does happen, you know who it is that's coming along beside you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Melissa, you just said my, my, your husband's the chief and he wants to create a, a formal track for new recruits and their families regarding a lot of the things we discussed tonight. Um, if you want to reach out to us, we can totally help you because that's one of the things that's that's actually how I met Cher, you know, totally started talking to Cher was we were putting on, uh, they were putting on an event for the new recruits and bringing families in. Uh, so uh, I was a, I was a hell yes to being involved in that. <laughs> I definitely wanted in on that. <laughs> Get them while they're young. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you, Cher, for being here tonight. And I appreciate your conversation. And um, I will uh, go ahead and stop recording for now.